In this video, I want to run through the common types of functions that we'll see in this course. This is a kind of bestiary, going over the main creatures that we are concerned with. In particular, I can make sure that you are all familiar with the names and terminology I'll be using throughout the course. Let's start with constant functions. A function has input and output. If the output is fixed, never changing regardless of the input, the function is constant. Since the y-coordinate represents the output, a constant function has a constant y-coordinate. Its graph is a horizontal line. No matter what x I start with, I get the same y-value, the same output. It might seem like a trivial case, but the simplest cases turn out to be very important in mathematics. We need constant functions. In particular, in the last video, I talked about how functions encode dependencies. A constant function encodes a lack of dependency. The output doesn't depend on the input. It is the same no matter what you put in. And it's important to be able to say this mathematically. To write a constant function, I'll just write f of x equals c, where c is some constant, indicating that the, the output is c no matter what input x is given. Constant functions have no domain restrictions. The next types of functions are linear functions. Linear means like a line, and these functions indeed have graphs which are straight lines. We talked about equations of lines in last week's video, so it should come as no surprise that the form for a linear function is a linear equation, f of x equals ax plus b, where a and b are some constants. The number a is the slope of the line, and b is the y-intercept. All that I said last week about equations of lines can now be interpreted as information about the graphs of linear functions. In particular, I can take a equals zero, and the linear functions therefore include the constant functions whose graphs are straight lines. Again, linear functions have no domain restrictions. One very important linear function is the identity function. This is the function that gives the input back unaltered. Whatever you put into this machine is just returned. f of three equals three, f of 100 equals 100, the same for any input. Again, this might seem like a trivial thing, but to repeat myself, these simple cases are very important. It's good to have a function that captures the idea of doing nothing to the input and giving it back. The next class of functions are quadratic functions. These also come from last week's discussion of analytic geometry. These are parabolas, one of the types of conics I discussed. A quadratic function allows for the input to be squared in addition to what was already allowed with linear functions, giving the form f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are some constants. Since the other conics didn't satisfy the vertical line test, they were not graphs of functions. The parabola is the only one of the conics that very naturally shows up as a graph. And a quadratic function also has no domain restrictions. Continuing on, let me expand to talk about polynomial functions. A polynomial, as I hope you remember from high school, is an expression in a variable with positive whole number powers multiplied by coefficients and added or subtracted together. In the first examples, where the, power, where the whole number of powers are 5, 3, 2, and 1, and 0 for the constant term, then I multiply by constants, in this case 1, 4, 2, 9, and 1, and I add or subtract to put it all together. Anything I can make in this way is called a polynomial. The highest power is called the degree of the polynomial. So this example is a degree five polynomial. Constant functions have no variables. And if I think carefully, I can think of this as x to the zero. So constant functions have degree zero. Linear functions only have x, which again by thinking carefully is x to the one. So they have degree one. Quadratics have x to the 2, so they have degree 2, and so on, to any finite degree I want. If I wanted to write a very general form of a polynomial, I do it this way. The degree is some whole number n. The top term is x, term is x to the n multiplied by some number a n. Then it can have any lower order terms, so I start writing those. The next lowest term is x to the n minus 1 multiplied by some number a n minus 1, and so on. This, and so on, is indicated by these three dots. This notation always means that some pattern continues. After dropping degrees enough, I end with the last term. 
the quadratic term x squared multiplied by some number a2, the linear term x multiplied by some number a1, and then some constant a0. This general form is very unwieldy with all the constants and indices, but it's very valuable to have a general pattern to use and talk about. Now, let's get back to the graph. For any polynomial, f of x equals the polynomial is a function. These are polynomial functions. They all have graphs. What I've drawn here is a degree three polynomial, a cubic. I can start to notice a pattern. A linear function was a straight line, a quadratic had one change in direction, and this cubic has two changes in direction. A quartic, degree four polynomial, can have three changes in direction, leading to a W type shape. In general, the rough shape of the graph of a polynomial is a wobble like this. And if the polynomial has degree n, there can be n minus one changes in direction. This gives a good idea of the general shape of polynomial graphs. Moving on, a rational function is the ratio of two polynomials, one divided by the other. In the diagram, I've drawn the ratio x cubed plus 2x squared minus x minus 3 divided by 3x squared minus 9x minus 12. In general, any polynomial divided by any other polynomial gives a rational function. The variety of shapes increases with these functions. The drawing here is but a particular example. Rational functions have domain restrictions. One of the rules for the domain of a function is that I can't divide by 0. Since there is a polynomial in the denominator, I need to avoid the values of the variable x that would lead to the denominator producing zero. That is, I avoid the roots of the polynomial in the denominator. In this example, x equals negative one in the denominator leads to zero. So x equals negative one is excluded from the domain. You can also see in the diagram the behavior of functions near the undefined point. The function becomes very steep. As I get close to x equals negative one, the function gets very close to the vertical line x equals negative one. This line is called a vertical asymptote. Vertical asymptotes are possible for rational functions and they can happen at a value of x which is a root of the denominator polynomial. We'll return to asymptotes in a couple of weeks. Finally, let me define the family of algebraic functions. An algebraic function is any function that I can make using polynomials and roots. This includes complicated expressions with polynomials inside roots. In the diagram here, I've drawn the function f of x equals the square root of x squared plus one divided by the square root of x squared minus one as an example. This is a large class of functions and I can say very little, little about the shape since there is great variety. Domain restrictions are possible here for two reasons. First, as with rational functions, there can be division by zero problems. Any time an algebraic function has a denominator with a, a root, I may need to make sure that I exclude the value that would lead to division by zero. In addition, now that I'm dealing with roots, I also need to worry about domain restrictions for roots. I can't take an even root, a square root, a fourth root, a sixth root of a negative number. Therefore, any expression inside an even root must be positive or zero. In this example, the expressions inside the roots, x squared plus seven and x squared plus one are always positive. So this example has no domain restrictions, but I do always have to check. 